afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming down today. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a note to our internet audience of watching at home, if you are interested in today's book, we could ship it wherever you are in the US free of charge. Just call the number on your screen. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Mr. Jeff Morgan and his new book, The Covenant Kitchen, Food and Wine for the New Jewish Table. Mr. Morgan and his wife Jody are co-owners of Covenant Winery in Berkeley, California, where they produce what wine critic Robert Parker has called the world's finest kosher wines. They are the authors of seven previous cookbooks. In this book, with more than two decades of professional food writing and wine making experience, Jeff and Jody Morgan share their favorite recipes and in a first for a kosher cookbook, detailed suggested wine pairings to give us a cookbook that respects Jewish customs, gives traditional food creative culinary makeovers, and introduces flavorful new dishes that will become family favorites. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Jeff Morgan. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, welcome to The Covenant Kitchen Meets Miami. Um, the Covenant Kitchen is, of course, named after my wife's and my winery, Covenant Winery, in, uh, that was in Napa Valley for the last 15 years, but is now in Berkeley, California. So it's an urban winery right in the middle of Berkeley. And uh, in the Covenant Winery and in our Covenant home, we have, a, we have two kitchens. We have one in the winery and we have one at home. And um, the kitchens are kosher, just like our winery is kosher, but as the ad said about Levi's rye bread, you don't have to be Jewish to love this bread. You don't have to be Jewish to enjoy this book either. This is a, a book that really is a reflection of our California lifestyle, um, the way we live in the California wine country, and how we pair food with wine at almost every meal except breakfast. When you pair wine with your breakfast, then you have a problem. But, uh, but aside from that, it's really great with lunch, one glass, maybe two, as long as you have espresso afterwards. And um, for dinner, we always have a glass or two of wine. Um, we are actually as interested in what's on our plate, or on, in our glass, as we are as what's on our plate. So um, what is The Covenant Kitchen about? Well, let's, let me show you the book. So the book looks like this, and uh, there are some potato pancakes, some uh, traditional, it's a Jewish recipe, potato pancakes, latkes, great for Hanukkah, but this being close to Pesach, to Passover, we're not necessarily recommending you make the Hanukkah recipe for Passover, it just happened to be a really great recipe, we wanted to put it on the, on the cover. But we have all sorts of really interesting recipes that you can prepare for uh, Passover in there, uh, such as our gefilte canel. Now, everybody's heard of gefilte fish? Filled the fish in my day or came out of a can or a jar and it was pretty bad. So we make a gefilte canal from some kind of fresh fish like salmon or halibut and it's a, it's a fish dumpling and it's prepared with fresh leeks and, and um, it's really quite good. Um, we also make something called matzo ball fish soup which is instead of the chicken soup you make it with matzo, uh, you make it with fish soup, a fish stock, which is really quite easy to make and quite a bit different. In fact, I think I'm gonna, I think I can probably find that. I'm gonna look for this really quickly because I, I have to show you the picture of the fish, the matzo ball fish soup, which is just gorgeous. Hold on, here we're coming to, ah, is that beautiful or what? Let me look at that. Oh. That is a beautiful dish and it tastes good too. Nothing fishy about it. No, not at all. Now, <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about why we wrote this book. Basically, my wife Jody unfortunately had to run the winery, so I sent her back to California. Uh, a few days ago, I got to stay in beautiful Miami. Um, but um, we grew up as what we call lox and bagels Jews. In other words, we knew about lox and bagels. We had those on Sunday mornings. And then we didn't know much else about being Jewish because we had no Jewish education. Our parents were fairly assimilated. We uh, didn't go to a Jewish day school. We didn't go to synagogue. We did nothing. As a matter of fact, I wasn't even bar mitzvah. So there was nothing happening here. It was a very assimilated existence. And um, fast forward, 
I was a young man, I was about 20 years old. I decided I was going to study music in France, which was my first career. And I went to study at a, uh, at a conservatory in the south of France. And my first lunch at the student restaurant was a revelation. I mean, I couldn't recognize anything on my plate. It was all very exciting and it tasted great. And in a flash, I realized I'd been eating badly all my life. And not only with that great lunch, which cost 50 cents, two francs, um, I was offered a, a glass of wine. And uh, this for, a, I wasn't even 21 yet. It was great. I realized something was going on here. And if I didn't learn how to play music, at least I was going to learn how to eat and drink. So that was good. Anyway, I stayed in France a little longer than I thought, almost 10 years, and um, learned how to eat and drink very well, and uh, became the band leader at the Grand Casino in Monte Carlo. And, uh, you know, I had the big hair, the shiny suits, the dancing girls, and it was like, wow, this is great, except for one thing, I was very unhappy, because I was making music that I didn't particularly like, and nobody was listening anyway, because it was in the casino, even though, and people... People were there for, to gamble, not to listen to the music, even though it was a, a great band and it was a big audience. So one night, I'm up there playing my horn. I was a saxophone player. And I realized, you know, there's something. I must, there must be some more to life than this. What else do I love besides music? And I realized, wow, I love wine. Come on in. Okay. okay. So... I decided, just like I remember I was in the, the, the student restaurant there, realizing in a flash that I'd been eating badly all my life. Well, this was um, another revelation. Okay, I'm going to become a winemaker. I made music, now I can make wine. So I came back to America. I was a whopping 35 years old at the time and got a job in a little winery and um, made wine there for a few years and uh, played music on the side. But lo and behold, that was not so easy either. I was working nights, I was working days, and I decided to become a wine writer and go back to being a full-time musician. Somehow I worked my way into the New York Times. I had a big story on Long Island Wines, which is where I was making wine, and a magazine called Wine Spectator. Have you heard of that magazine? A magazine called Wine Spectator saw this article, and they had known me for the wines I had made when I was making wine in Long Island. And they called and they said, oh, Morgan, we didn't know you were a wine writer. And I said, well, I wasn't when I met you, but now I am. And they said, great, we have, an art we have a, a story we'd like you to write. This is back in 1992. And I said, the wine spectator? A story for me? I can't believe it. This is fantastic. What? And they said, we want you to write about kosher wine for Passover. <laughs> I said, you're kidding, right? I don't know anything about kosher. I don't know anything about Passover. I mean, and they said, but you're Jewish, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I said, yeah, I'm Jewish, but, you know, no bar mitzvah, no nothing. I, I, I don't know if I can do this. And they said, well, look, this is your foot in the door. Last year we had somebody write an article about kosher wines who wasn't Jewish. We were accused of being anti-Semitic. This year you can say what you want, but at least you're Jewish, so we're safe. <laughs> I said, they said, take it or leave it, Morgan. This is your chance. So I took it. And I did some quick studying. I called a lot of kosher winemakers. I called the Herzog family, who makes a lot of kosher wine and imports a lot of kosher wine. And I cobbled together a story that apparently the wine spectator liked. And they let me do more and more stories. Fast forward, they moved me to California. I became the West Coast editor in 1995. And then I moved back to Napa Valley. Or I moved to Napa Valley in 2000 because I wanted to make wine again. I was tired about writing about wine, and I wanted to make it. Somehow... I, but I knew a lot about kosher wine by that time, because every year I had to write about it. So we had a little tasting group up in the Napa Valley, circa 9, 2002. And I knew that there was an Israeli winemaker coming in from um, Israel to sell his wines. We invited him to our tasting group. And I was there with the guy who's now my partner and my business partner, Leslie Rudd, who owns a beautiful winery uh, in Napa Valley and vineyard. Not kosher, but he's a Jewish guy. Nice Jewish boy from Wichita, Kansas. And we tasted this wine from Castel, Domaine du Castel. And it was so good that Leslie said, wow, I can't believe that wine is kosher. And I said, Les, it's great wine because he had good grapes and he knows how to make wine. We could make the greatest kosher wine in 5,000 years if you give me 10 tons of your fabulous Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. And I said, and he said, he looked at me and he said, are you out of your mind? 
What if you screw it up, Morgan? It's going to be the worst kosher wine in 5,000 years with my grapes. So I said, so what do you want to do, Les? And he said, you find somebody else's grapes to experiment with, and I'll be your financial backer. So with that in mind, I found another vineyard. We made some great wine, um, and we became well known for our covenant wines. That was back in, 19, in 2003 was our first vintage. All this time, uh, well, we've been living in the wine country. We've been eating really well. We, you know, we lived in France a long time, so we have a Mediterranean cuisine at home. We use a lot of olive oil, fresh ingredients. Um, living in California, we discovered Mexican cooking. We discovered Asian cooking in a way that we hadn't discovered it elsewhere. So we really incorporated a lot of international cuisine into our cooking. And uh, I'd also, to make ends meet, I'd started writing cookbooks. So I wrote something called Dean and DeLuca, the food and wine cookbook. I wrote another book called uh, The Working Parents Cookbook with my wife. We wrote a book called The Domaine Chandon Cookbook and a few others as well. So we had a knack for writing cookbooks. And I found that as I was working on the kosher wine, I had to have um, more religious Jews in the cellar, in the cellar with me to help me make the wine because really what makes it kosher is who touches it. It's as simple as that. So I found myself being attracted to this Jewish thing and I wanted to know more about being Jewish. And I started studying Hebrew and I finally got bar mitzvah when I was 54. And um, we started to incorporate our very secular life into what became a more religious life. Um, we just finally, after 61 years, I finally joined the synagogue, better late than never, right? And uh, in Berkeley, where we've now moved. We left Napa Valley about a year ago to build a winery in Berkeley because we wanted to be in a more Jewish community. And we decided that it would be nice to write a kosher cookbook, or one that at least would work in a kosher kitchen, because by now we had a kosher kitchen, a lot of our friends had a kosher kitchen, and that's how the Covenant Kitchen was born. Um, we have seen a lot of Jewish and or kosher cookbooks that have recipes from you know, their grandma and their great-grandma. This is not what you'll find here. There is one recipe inspired by my grandmother, but um, the gefilte canal. But, um, but basically, it's our, the way we eat. And um, however, um, I think that w one thing that we found w that was missing in many, many other Jewish-themed or kosher cookbooks is the wine component. I mean, as winemakers, we wanted to integrate that into our book in a way nobody else has. And so every recipe has wine pairings. And it's generic. It's not like drink covenant wine. It's, you know, whatever, a, a Chardonnay or a Pinot Grigio or a Cabernet will go with this dish. And we tell you why. And there's also a very, uh, there's a chapter on how to pair food with wine. There are tips on, uh, you know, how to, what kind of wine glasses to use and all sorts of uh, information that I think uh, the reader will find helpful in uh, navigating the so-called food and wine pairing game. And um, it's really quite simple. Um, in fact, I can give it to you in about three sentences, but I took two pages to say it in the book. Um, <laughs> similarly styled wines go well with similarly styled foods. So if you can describe what's on your plate in simple terms like this is a light, fresh tasting dish, then you probably want to have a light, fresh tasting wine, just like the one that we were drinking. If you were drinking the Chardonnay tonight, like the, the tribe Chardonnay. If it's a richer dish, you might want to have a more full-bodied, rich wine like a Cabernet, but it doesn't have to be red. It could be a rich, full-bodied, barrel-fermented Chardonnay, for example. So it's really a stylistic thing. Similarly styled foods go with similarly styled wines. And that's the gist of it. If you can keep that on, in your mind, you, you know it all. Um, the book is set up kind of the way we eat. Appetizers, salads, soups, pastas, fish dishes, uh, meat dishes, and desserts. And we tend to eat in courses at my house because that way we can really enjoy our wine. You know, it doesn't, I, I've often, I, 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 had, I had lunch the other day at a friend's house. And I mean, it was a phenomenal meal with the greatest dishes. But they ate them all at once. And it was kind of, they were all laid out in a buffet and everybody filled their plates. And I found that everybody was through eating in 20 minutes. If I'd had that much food for lunch, it would have taken me four hours to eat it because I would have eaten a little bit this, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit this. So um, I recommend that you eat in courses and that you enjoy 
maybe a white wine to start if you're going to linger over dinner, and then maybe a red wine with your main course if it's a richer dish. Um, let's see. I think that's about it for what's in the book. Um, suffice it to say, we have a beautiful winery in downtown Berkeley, which is across the bay from San Francisco. You're all invited to come visit us, and we'll give you a great wine tasting, and we might even cook you lunch. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about what else is in the book, feel free to ask. Just a question. Um, in regards to like the kosher wine, like what is the like what are the parameters of making it a kosher wine? That's what I'm intrigued. Okay, well it's really simple. Um, all wine is kosher. All wine is considered holy. It's the holy beverage. It's the only holy beverage in the Jewish tradition. The only holy substance that passes across your lips. And we use wine to um, officiate holy days, ceremonies, important moments. And every time we drink wine, when we start drinking, we say a little blessing. And, uh, but the wine is already holy by itself. It doesn't need to be blessed. And what keeps it holy is really quite symbolic. There is no kosher winemaking method. We make the wine just as I would make it if it wasn't kosher. The only difference is that the wine can only be touched by a Sabbath observant Jew. That means somebody who follows all the tenets of kashrut, all of the dietary restrictions. They only eat kosher food. They only drink kosher wine. They don't work on the Sabbath or other holy days. And um, once they satisfy all those uh, commandments, then they're, they can work in our cellar. Otherwise, they can't. Okay. So, so then basically it's kind of like the same process like if you have a Chardonnay, you put it in like an oak barrel and all yeah. that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know that. The Chard did you try the Chardonnay? Yes. Yeah. So that, that uh, we pressed those grapes. We brought them in from the vineyard, pressed the grapes, the juice, put the juice in barrels. We didn't even add yeast. All our wines we ferment with native yeast, so we, we add nothing. Started fermenting, and uh, then we put that wine, once it was done, in a bottle, and you're drinking it. Um, it's the same process. It's a very natural, simple process. Yes. Do you have like wine for Pesach, for Passover? Well, yes. I mean, all of our wines are kosher for Passover. That means simply that, you know, for Passover, you know, that's the time everybody eats matzah. In fact, we have also, I forgot to tell you, we have, um, in the back of the book, we have holiday menus. So we have suggestions for different holidays like Passover, di different dishes that would make a nice meal if you go to the end of the book. Um, for Passover, we're eating matzah because we're not supposed to eat any food that has leavening in it, any that has been leavened. So bread, for example, and other grains. Uh, most grains are not allowed either. So um, as long as the wine never came in touch with what we call chametz, anything that's not kosher for Passover, the wine is kosher for Passover. Now, any kosher winemaker who doesn't make a wine that's kosher for Passover would have to be completely out of his mind because... I'd say 75% of our wines are sold in the month before Passover. It's kind of like New Year's Eve and Champagne. Mm -hmm. Passover is, a, is, is built around wine. And so I would be very surprised if there's a kosher wine out there that's not kosher for Passover. Do you have a mashkiach who comes and you know, says, this is good? You know, like the word is mashkiach. How many people know the word mashkiach? Okay, that's a good word. Good question. A mashkiach is somebody who is uh, certified to by some kind of certifying organization, kosher certifying organization, to tell, to make sure that everything's kosher in the winery, that everything stays kosher. I don't have one mashkiach, I have two, because we like to go the distance at Covenant. And it just so happens that my associate winemaker is also a certified mashkiach from the Union of Orthodox Rabbis in New York, and his uh, the cellar master is also a certified Mishkiach, so covered. we're covered, yeah. <laughs> but that was a good question, because you do, if you want that little certification that they call a hexer, it's on the back of the bottle, on the back label, like R says O-U-P, which means kosher for Passover, certified by the O-U, you probably are going to have to have a mishkiach. But we don't have rabbis overseeing it, and there's nobody saying blessings over the wine, there's none of that. It's much simpler. Uh, yes? Could you describe the different wines that you make? Good question. <laughs> Um, we, we make at Covenant, we started with, remember I said to Leslie Rudd, give me 10 tons of your Cabernet and we will make the greatest kosher wine. Well, 
We started with one wine, Cabernet Sauvignon, from Napa Valley, and it still is our flagship wine, the Covenant Cabernet. But we also make um, 11 different wines. So we make two different Chardonnays in different ways. Um, one stays in the barrel longer. It's a richer, lusher style. The other is a lighter, fresher style. That's the one some of you might have drunk tonight. Um, we also make um, um, two different Cabernets now, actually three different Cabernets. We make two wines called Red Sea. We make the Red Sea White and we make the Red Sea Red. It's just a big C on the, on the uh, bottle, kind of a joke, you get it, right? And uh, so our Red Sea wines are um, Sauvignon Blanc and kind of a blend of various reds. Uh, we also have, of course, we have the Tribe Red, which is a blend of Syrah, Petit Syrah, and um, uh, Zinfandel. And then we have a wine club called the Lanzmann Wine Club. Mm -hmm. And the Lanzmann Wine Club, we make three different wines that are, you can only get as club members. One's Syrah, one is uh, Zinfandel, and one is Petit, uh, Pinot Noir. So I think we made like 32 different wines this year, but they're not all going to be bottled separately. We have, um, we, we blend different wines. We made Petit Verdot this year. We made Grenache. We made, we source our grapes from small plots in different vineyards from Sonoma all the way to Lodi, which is in the Central Valley. That includes also Napa Valley. And then we see what we've got kind of halfway through the year and we make our blends accordingly. So. A lot of wine, yeah. We've, and in our new winery, we've kind of uh, doubled our production in the last year. We went from 3,000 cases to 6,000 cases. We're going to grow to about 10,000 cases. And we're, um, we're distributed all over the world. You can find us in Toronto you can find, and throughout Canada. We're in 20 states in America, including here in, in, uh, in Miami. That's a state, right? Miami? Miami. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, state of yeah, and we also, um, we're in um, Israel. We're in London, we're in Paris. Can you believe it? They're buying kosher American wine in Paris, but they, you know, but they, they seem to like it. And uh, we're also in Australia um, and uh, Central America. We're in Colombia, we're in Mexico. So we're getting around and um, it's good, it's good. Yes? I think your story, your personal story is amazing. And I was wondering which shul synagogue did you choose to join? Did you become Orthodox? Or That's a good question, too. You know, um, in Berkeley, there's a whole Reconstructionist thing going on, which is kind of very liberal, forward-thinking Jews. I preferred to go with the forward-thinking Orthodox Jews, so I joined a modern Orthodox synagogue. Yeah. So you'll see me there uh, most Saturday mornings, you know, with my keep on my talit. Feels good. Who would have thought? Yeah, that's what my mother says. <laughs> yes. Is your wine available in any wine shops in, in the Miami area? Yes, of course. Given the fact that they're kosher, there are a lot more wine shops in Aventura uh, and, uh, and uh, points north where you can find all of my wines. I know they have been available. Um, uh, I know that uh, Jeff Wolf has had a number of my wines available at Wolf's, which is right around here, it's somewhere over there. And I guarantee you, if you go into Wolf's um, tomorrow or whenever, and say, do you have any of Jeff Morgan's Covenant Wines or the Red Sea? I know he used to have my Red Sea, Sauvignon Blanc. If he doesn't, he knows where to find it because my distributor, he knows my distributor. So, um, yes. So the answer is yes, we're available, but I can't tell you exactly where because I just don't know. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say uh, since you asked about the personal story. So interestingly enough, uh, it's worn off on my kids too. I, yeah, it's, well, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> One of them lives in New York. She's great, and she does, uh, you know, she does publicity for wine and spirits companies. And she is not particularly in, interested in her Judaism, although she's, she's fine with it. But the little one, who's 23, she's now an Israeli citizen, and she lives in Israel. She's moved to Tel Aviv, and she's helping me plan my next move, which is a winery in Israel. So we're actually already making wine in Israel. Covenant Israel is coming. Uh, we'll have it uh, for sale actually this fall. Uh, we're bottling it in Israel in May, and that's a blend of Syrah and Cabernet Franc from the Golan Heights yeah. and from, yeah, from the Golan and also from uh, the Galilee. It's a blend. So look for Covenant. The Covenant past and present. Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, well, yes. One question, because I've never understood. What is Meshubal and non-Meshubal? It's like Meshugana. 
which is what you are. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, Meshuggah means, Meshuggah, I just made a little Yiddish joke. Meshuggah means kind of crazy. I'm glad you uh, made the joke instead yeah. of me because yeah. I've been on the tip of my tongue. But um, Mavushal, as opposed to Meshuggah, Mavushal is the word, the one word that is very hard for me to explain to um, everybody because it means cooked in Hebrew. And it has to do with Everybody thinks that kosher wines have to be cooked or boiled, but that's not true. Remember I said kosher wine is just, it's any wine that's only been touched by the right people, okay? Meaning Sabbath observant Jews. However, there's a problem if, uh, at least halakhically, that means according to Jewish law, there's no problem really, but if you're following the strict laws, um, it also extends to who can open the bottle and, for who, and who you, that bottle can be poured to. So for example, you're Jewish. You're not Jewish, are you? Kind of. Kind of. You're, 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 you want to be Jewish. I know, I know you. You want to be Jewish. So, uh, but if you're not Jewish and the wine is not Mavushal, in other words, it's been made like most of our wines, which native yeast, we don't boil it, we don't filter it, it's very natural. In theory, depending on how strict um, I am or whoever's pouring is, that wine would have to, uh, would need to be poured by um, uh, an Orthodox Jew, somebody who's Sabbath observant, to another Sabbath observant Jew, just to keep it in the Sabbath observant family. Now, being Jewish is not being Jewish enough. For example, I'm not, even though I go to Orthodox synagogue, I'm not really Sabbath observant, or at least fully. I'm somewhat Sabbath observant, but I don't quite make it. So, according to some, uh, according to many, uh, Orthodox Jews, I should not open that bottle and pour it to somebody who is strictly Sabbath observant. I would have to have my Meshgiach do that, or, or uh, some other Orthodox person who is so designated. All this being said, uh, if you're drinking the non mavusha wine, you're drinking our regular wines, and you don't care, what difference does it make? Okay, if you're, it, it just doesn't really matter. It only matters if you care, but um, but I didn't want to do that boiling, that heating of the wine, because I didn't want to hurt my wines. Now, lately, I have discovered a new technique called flash détente. And flash détente allows me to not heat the wine to 195 degrees or 180 degrees or whatever is required, but I heat the grapes. It's, uh, it's a new machine in the wine country being used by non-kosher wineries also because it highlights fruit quality and makes things taste a little juicier and fruitier, and people want that. Um, I don't do it to my non my my non mavushal wines, but I pick my grapes. I bring the grapes in. I put it through the machine. It's the, you've got these big pipes. It heats the grapes up as it goes through this pi these pipes, and then they drop into a vacuum once they've been heated to a certain temperature. The vacuum cools it down immediately to about 80 degrees. I press the juice out of the grapes, and I put that juice in barrels and let those barrels ferment with native yeast, and then I never have to heat the wine because they ferment. The juice has already been heated. It's kind of like pasteurized fruit juice. You, you drink orange juice, right? And that tastes pretty good. That's been pasteurized, or apple juice. Typically, it's pasteurized. The heating doesn't hurt the juice the way the heating hurts the wine. The wine with the alcohol doesn't like getting heated and has a little, kind of, can have a little bit of a, uh, a tarry or a burned rubber kind of quality, especially in the reds. So we've avoided that, I think. Did you notice that the, the tribe red tasted kind of burned rubbery? No. No. So, yeah, so that is a Mavushal wine. The, I'm pouring my two Mavushal wines tonight, the tribe Chardonnay and the tribe red. I also have another Mavushal wine called Mensch. <laughs> Mensch, and uh, Mensch white and Mensch red. They're not available in, in, in um, Miami, but you can buy them direct from us off our website, and we ship. So, so, um, so, and Mensch White is a bl is Roussan, basically a Rhone varietal, and the Mensch Red is mostly Zinfandel. A wonderful gift to give someone. Yeah, and on the back it says everybody loves a Mensch, which is true. <laughs> so, uh, and it's a fun label. So you can see all these labels if you go to our website, uh, CovenantWines.com. You'll see um, pictures of all our bottles. We have some beautiful labels that are all hand drawn by various artists in the wine country, good friends of ours, and. Uh, we love them, and we have a little art gallery in our winery uh, with some of our the original art that went into the Covenant label, which is uh, quite ex exceptional, and then um, some art from our favorite uh, Israeli artists that we've also brought back from Israel with us. And then when you see that is the, the Covenant Israel label, 
which is not is still a secret, top secret, but you're gonna love it because it's quite nice, quite different from everything we've done before. So, any more questions? Questions or comments? Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you Victor. Yeah. All right. I did, I did notice um, a few yeah. of you came in a little late, so if you want to take a look at the book, and I'll be, I'll be here for a little bit, we can talk about it. But you know, we've got 100 recipes that'll work, whether your house is kosher or not, doesn't matter. Mediterranean cooking, Asian influences, Mexican influences, and um, every, every recipe has wine pairings. So it, if you have any doubt about how to pair food with wine, you won't after you look at this book for about five minutes. Covenant Kitchen is for sale at the counter or in the front room over there. Jeff's going to be signing over there at the table to the left of the podium. And there's still a lot of his delicious wine left on the table in the back. So please give Jeff Morgan another hand. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.